This is a Weekend Explorer Quick Trip. Since Resurrection Bay was the closest frost-free harbor to Nome during the gold rush at the turn of the 19th century, it became a supply depot. Supplies were taken over a series of unmarked trails by dog sled. These trails were eventually called the Iditarod, after the most common destination, the Iditarod Mining District. Seward is mile zero of this National Historic Trail. In 1973, a dog sled race was started in commemoration of this time. Young Danny is the third generation in the CB family to be part of this race. The family runs the cleverly named I Did a Ride, where you can be pulled by sled dogs training for the race. Once the dogs know it's time for a run, they definitely let you know they want to go along. You may have expected to see Malamutes or Huskies, but those dogs are not very good at the long distance running required for the Iditarod. These dogs are specially bred, but are of no special breed. I don't know what the CVs eat for breakfast, but with all of that energy, I want some. These dogs are definitely not camera shy. During the Iditarod, dogs are examined frequently to make sure they are in good health. Dogs not passing this test are flown home. In 1973, the Iditarod was more of an adventure race, and the winner took 23 days to get to Nome. Today, the trail is maintained and marked, and the winners finish in less than 10 days. Even so, the Iditarod is probably the world's most grueling sporting event. Since the Iditarod is more about finesse and stamina than strength, Women have taken home the gold more than once. Hello. Hello. and I couldn't resist taking a few minutes to play with a new litter of pups. What are you doing over there, huh? How's puppy life, huh? How's it going? How's it going? Hi. So, Danny, tell me about the clothes you wear. Okay, we're going to start with the boots here. I can go ahead and take your shoes off and put those back okay. on there. But... Boy, they are thick. They are very thick. So I'm oh, gonna... comfy, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is your, or the inner layer of your parka there. And underneath okay. that, you'd wear just a very thin layer of polypropylene long underwear. It's all designed to wick the moisture away from your skin. Because if you're going to be in the same clothes for nine or ten days, it's very important that you stay dry out there. And you have your outer layer, the nylon shell. This is your, your windproof and waterproof layer. Just to I'm starting to feel Alaskan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can just buckle that up in the front there. And here's your hat there. Of course, our headlight is how we can see at night. Of course, we have the sponsors' names all over everything there. We have your ruff. <laughs> and the fur is actually one of the warmest materials out there. You just can't use a lot of it because it's not as good with the moisture in that. Once you do get it wet, it's very hard to dry it back out again. You have your bib here. Um, my dad, of course, is number four there. The mushers draw for starting positions before the race starts in uh -huh. two-minute intervals. You have to wear your bib so everybody can tell them apart out there. Well, what's the second thumb for? The, the third finger there, it's something the Army came up with, I believe, in World War I. They call it a trigger finger. I have no idea why it's in these gloves. Oh. The biggest mistake is that it's not insulated, so nobody ever uses it here. But, no. okay. Maybe that's just for, like, your competitor. Yeah. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> and there's your musher. Woohoo! On dancer, on prancer. <laughs> now, like, if a... a Polar bear was going to take you. You would never know he was coming with all this stuff on. <laughs> you wouldn't know. Sometimes you can't even tell, hardly tell where your dogs are. I think it'd be a little bit small for you here, but. All right. Well, good stuff. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah.